Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to direct you to the restrooms, uh, which are just through this large room on the right there. After the Q&A, after the talk, and then after the Q&A, the reception afterward is going to be out here on the patio. Uh, so those are the only logistical things I think you need to know. And then to introduce the speaker today, we have our own Professor Paul Durish. Uh, so I'll pass this over to Paul. I am conscious that the most interminable introductions are the ones that begin by saying our speaker today needs no introduction. So I'm going to try and avoid that, but we'll see. Jeffrey Bowker was born in England at a very early age. Perhaps I'll skip that part. Um, so, so as you all know, I think, uh, Jeff has been and continues to be um, a foundational figure in bringing uh, thinking, understandings for, and thinking in STS and the history of science to the study of information systems. And when I say information systems, I don't simply mean big boxes whirring away in air conditioned rooms, um, nor like, you know, the latest fabulous device in our pockets, but the entire complicated edifice of materials and procedures um, that, you know, and understandings that um, manage and organize information so that it can be processed, made legible, and operated on by those big machines and by the people who run those big machines and so forth. Um, his reformulation of the concept of infrastructure um, has pervaded research in STS, HCI, and CSCW and become foundational to current work in critical data studies. Um, and at the same time, his understandings of uh, in the, the history of information systems has essentially been bi-directional, not just studying the historical emergence and organization of information systems, but also recognizing information systems as themselves historical and recognizing those information practices as themselves historical processes of shaping data and making certain things legible again and archival, archivable and you know, selective processes by which information systems record um, history increasingly in sort of contemporary circumstances. As you know, um, Jeff recently retired from his position as Donald Bren Professor in, um, in the Department of Informatics, but of course we hope he'll be a very active emeritus professor. Um, and so today's talk actually has three different billings. It is part of the regular series of informatics department seminars. It is a distinguished lecture for CREATE, the Center for Responsible, Ethical, and Accessible Technology. And it is also the keynote event for a two-day um, celebration that we're holding of uh, Jeff and his um, accomplishments and his influences and uh, the ongoing influence that he has in many of our scholarly lives. And so for that reason is why um, there are so many people who have um, come to celebrate Jeff and, at that event who are here with us today. So I'm also mentioning to the students that many of the people who write the papers and books that you read and learn from in our classes are here in the room with us today. So you should take advantage of that opportunity, but do not pester anybody. Um, make, make sure they get to the wine and the beer first, um, and after that they're fair game. But, <laughs> So if, if everyone is appropriately warned. Um, so if we had thought of a fourth billing to add, we would have done, but we kind of ran out of labels or space on the poster. Um, so, so I think everybody, myself included, would much rather hear from Jeff than from me. Um, so Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start with an interminable set of thank yous. Um, it's wonderful to see so many friends, dear colleagues in the audience. Well, that's it. <laughs> um, I'm feeling, right now I'm feeling a bit like a monk who's broken their, a Trappist monk who's broken their vow of silence. And I'm between two, you know, pillar and post. Am I either just, going to talk in a flood of words, or have I forgotten how to speak? Because um, this is only the second talk, live talk I've given since uh, since COVID. So gosh knows how it's going to go, but hey, there we are. All right. Where is it? Oh, sorry, give me a minute. That should work now. Yeah, let me start with, um, 
Sleeping Wood, who couldn't be here today. Um, Susan Lee Starr, um, my first partner and the person who brought me to the States. I mean, I basically came to the States just to be with Lee and the academic job was just a sideline, you know, to kind of <laughs> keep, keep me interested and keep me busy. Um, that's me on the right and the far right. Um, just as I decided to do a PhD, I was um, reading Levi Strauss on a hilltop in, in Cameroon and decided to do a Levi Straussian uh, PhD, after which I discovered that there are no real Levi Straussians in the world anymore, so it's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> The, the other person um, represented is um, Judith Gregory, my current partner. Uh, Judith can't be here because she has uh, fairly advanced dementia at the moment, unfortunately. Um, among the people here, I mean, uh, let's, let's go back a little bit for the um, PhD. Um, let's call out David Turnbull, that's come from Australia. And some of my earliest and happiest days in academia were chatting over endless cigarettes and those long afternoons we had of drinking in the uh, in the HPS department on um, every Friday afternoon it started at 12 and finished about 10 in the evening and one of the jobs of the grad students was actually to <laughs> to, to, to buy the week's booze and <laughs> that was incredible but um all right let's get on with the tour um it's going to be in you know five five parts and, and i ended up putting in optimism and I, I keep trying to do optimism and it's so, so hard. Um, so, you know, I forced myself just to, to do the title and people, people it with a few slides. Um, and there's gonna be a couple of texts for the day, um, but this is the one I want to lead with and just um, keep in your mind if you, if you would during the, during the talk. This is from Jeff Vandermeer's uh, wonderful Southern Ridge trilogy. Um, I've been trying to remember this place, she said, almost plaintively. Um, I love it here, but the entire time I felt that it was one remembering me. So it's like, where is the locus of being um, in the world? Where is the locus of experience is a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so first on the class of, oh, sorry. Yeah, first on the classifying, um, here's one of my favorite slides I just remembered this a few weeks ago um this wonderful early punk song from um uh, from radio star um there are no russians in russia there are no yanks in la there are no chinese in china i guess they've all gone away there are no arabs in egypt there are no french in paris and i warmly commend the song to your attention if you if you've not heard it um but it reminds me and I, was, I was thinking about this about what's, what's my relationship with classification and it's sort of double um I basically grew up denying all classification, having difficulty with the concept of classification. Um, Lee, Lee Starr, um, who I wrote a number of things with, um, Lee was sort of the opposite of that. She embraced every classification. I mean, if a classification was out there, that was hers. Um, she was Jewish, Buddhist, a witch. Um, well, she was never a Catholic, but um, you know, she'd, she'd take on a fair number of them. And I, then I realized just yesterday, I think, that it's actually pretty much the same, whether you accept every classification or deny every classification, it's functionally the same. Um, but we're often told that we live in a world um, without classification, um, where, you know, the kind of market segmentation that was done in the 19, uh, really honed in the 1950s and 1960s, we were broken down into, I think, 300 or 350 or 400 categories um, for marketing purposes. And reminds me of um, the wonderful book by Zizek. I don't often use the word wonderful and Zizek in the same sentence, so, so please try and enjoy it, um, is The Fragile um, Absolute or Why the Christian Legacy is Worth Fighting For. And, the reason um, is that he ebulliently describes the um, um, he ebulliently describes the um, niche marketing um, that we're niche mar you know that we're all being niche marketed into classifications, and that niche marketing is actually having a huge effect on us. Um, it affects things we watch. It affects things we read. It affects clothes we wear. I mean, it's just being niche marketed, um, sort of out of existence. Um, and his argument, which I agree with, um, is that um, 
Um, yeah, his argument is that we should think about the political consequences of that. It's not that we're escaping classification. It's just that we're being classified into ever, ever small segments. Um, so in medicine in recent years, there's been a move to um, reasoning from n equals one, assuming everybody is different. Um, so what does, it what does it mean to reason from and generalize from n equals one? And there's a very, um, I have a quote here. Um, no, I don't. Okay. Um, so the way I've been thinking about it just lately is it's like you're still a drone um, in, you know, the emergent hive form of humanity. This is not the optimistic bit. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the hive mode of humanity. Um, but you're that special drone, um, you know, who likes radio stars, um, Pink Floyd, um, and uh, cinnabar wine. Um, so it's, it's like, yeah, the classification didn't go away. It's just, it just, just became smaller, um, which is weird. I mean, I was, I was thinking about what happens to class in that story. Um, well, it's quite funny because in America, everybody is middle class um, except um, Elon Musk. And um, I think there's a family in Louisiana, which is working class. Uh, but basically everybody is middle class. So we've both expanded the middle class so the class doesn't mean anything, and then narrowed our classifications so that natural activities cannot be, um, uh, natural liaisons can't be built. And when I really start playing with um, uh, classification, and uh, I go to Antonia Walford's work. She did a fantastic um, thesis a few years ago, which was about, um, um, streaming sensors in the um, in the Brazilian rainforest, mm -hmm. and you assume that's basically the most unmediated data you can get, free of classification systems. It's just the sensors are sitting up there, um, and um, <laughs> I love protecting the rainforest with IoT and recycled phones. Um, but uh, yeah, so the um, first point she makes is is plunkingly obvious, although. People like Latour have, you know, absolutely did forget it, as, as did Clay Shirky. Um, every point in, a, in um, that uh, every field in a database is a, is always already a theoretical classification. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, second point, which I loved in her work, where she said um, the sensor network is not just streaming data. Um, if the data is considered outside of theoretical bounds, if a quote unquote impossible gust of wind occur or a too rapid temperature change, then that data was thrown out as bad data. Um, so she argues that what you're doing is you're creating this kind of second nature inside the computer. And that second nature is sort of modeled on nature, but it's not a representation um, of nature. Um, every classification had to be well behaved. Um, what's the third point? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, her third point is about database managers, um, and they're so understudied. Database managers as a you know as a, as a field of uh, as a field of operation, and database managers, um, in in her case, would refuse to share the data with people that they didn't think could put it to good use. Um, and there's, there, there are quite a few examples like that I can multiply. So you've got all of these things that that build up kind of classifications and understanding of what just seems to be the rawest of raw data. So let's get into time and computing for a bit. Um, and another quote, this is from uh, a science fiction series I sort of like, and that's a bit too a Van Vogtie. Um, In one sense, everything you humans do is incidental to the main business of our civilization. So far, text control 90% of our resources, um, and useful energy and materials available to our society, including many resources of which no human uh, travels to become aware. In another sense, humans are crucial and essential to the civilization. And there's a way in which that's interestingly true. And, uh, you know, interesting enough, this does lead into the octopus, so I think it's great. Um, but it's the fact that what I'm going to talk about when I talk about time and computing is the fact that we've created a whole new um, ontological layer. So we need to understand that new ontological layer that we've created and we, we need to learn how to act in it. Otherwise, um, 
it'll just take over and act on us. So we're going to go through several different aspects of time and computing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and this was in the New York Times just, uh, uh, just the other day. Um, oh, I know it's not, not gone. Yeah, this was in the New York Times just the other day. Um, when we talk about the attention economy, where everybody, you know, is being, everybody's attention is being drawn. But the real people, the real entities paying attention are the computers. They're watching you all the time. They're observing you. Um, they're changing you. Um, so the attention economy is really about computers paying attention much more than about humans paying attention. I mean, we're, you know, we're sort of an afterthought. Um, and, uh, oh, um, And there's a you know, kind of fairly well-known example here, so I won't go through it in too much detail from Catherine Hales, uh, which he says, um, the missing, uh, between perception registering an event and consciousness processing it um, is a missing half second. This cost, the delay, assumes new importance when cognitive non-conscious technical devices can operate at temporal uh, regimes inaccessible to humans and exploit the missing half second to their advantage. Um, so again, that's an indication of the new kind of ontological layer that we're building and the, the, you know, and the significance of it. Um, this one's down to half a second, but we're gonna go through seconds in a little bit. Um, there's a, this is a graphic which has come out since um, I think 2013. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating on just the amount of data that's being shared every day. Um, also the movement of goods, I mean, but just, well, I don't, you can probably read that better than I can, so I'll just leave it up there for a second. Um, it's, but note the packing of time, that um, the, a simple de demonstration of the vacuity of human time is that some computers today can carry out calculations um, <coughs> relatively instantaneously that would work at the operation um, of one per second since the Big Bang, since the putative Big Bang, which never really existed. Um, so um, fastest computer is going about 16 metaflops, which is uh, petaflops, which is just huge. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale here, um, when you, <laughs> actually Helga will know the story too, too well, but when I started to work on, um, started to do some of this work, um, I, I titled it Life at the Femtosecond. Um, which is, what is it, uh, where is Fento? Yeah, 10 to the minus 15. Um, and then I had to rename it uh, Life at the Atto Second um, because we we're getting you know, more and more fine distinctions of time which were being made. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scale, um, there have been 10 to the 18 um, seconds since the Big Bang, um, but we are dividing time into units, basically Atto Second units. Um, it shoots only half an exa, uh, half an exa, which is um, uh, time since the Big Bang. Um, so you've got a network switch made by the firm Metamarco, which allows a trade order to be placed um, in the time it takes a photon to travel 90 feet. Um, and a book I'll refer to a little bit later, Lewis's wonderful uh, Flash Boys, um, is a description of this kind of process. And this is a process that has huge implications for us, and we have virtually no control over. Um, the uh, uh, Donald McKenzie wrote a great book about the uh, October crash. Um, in 2017, Aldrich and Krakowitz uh, estimated that in, two th in, in that year, um, 10 to 40 percent of trading volume in equities was uh, high frequency trading and 10 to 15 percent of volume in foreign exchange and commodities. Um, there are much higher estimates available if you want them. Um, so, and as you know, I mean, this, uh, God, I it was in a talk here, I, Paul might remember a few years ago, um, someone was mentioning that, um, um, oh, I forgot the point. I'll come back to it. Um, so, what I'm interested in then is sort of the colonization um, of time. And David Deutsch, who's one of them, actually quite brilliant, one of the founders of quantum computing, um, makes the argument that, um, I mean, 
it's not enough just to co uh, colonize time. We should colonize space time. Um, why should computers stop at the edges of our universe, which seems an unnecessary and unfair restriction um, on our activities? Mm -hmm. um, so for Deutsch, um, the quantum computer is um, harvesting, um, it's a distinctly new way of harnessing nature. It will be the first technology that allows useful tasks to be performed in collaboration um, between parallel universes. Um, so the question in his theory is polled over 10 to the 500 universes, and then it collapses onto the right solution more or less instantaneously in our time. Um, so, you know, we're not only colonizing this universe, uh, we're colonizing all the ones around us. Um, and this, you know, for the techies in the bunch, just means that NP complete problems can be solved. Um, and then Deutsch makes the move. I'm, I do recognize, by the way, that I'm, 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 I'm sort of moving a little bit between, um, you know, what's obvious hype and somewhat silly and what I think are very material things in the world. But that's the world that is inhabited by the people that I mostly study um, in computer science. Um, so Deutsch says evolution would never have got off the ground if the task of rendering certain properties of the earliest, simplest habitats had not been tractable that is computable in a reasonable time using readily available molecules as computers. Well, computers, in other words, uh, are um, practical under, um, under a given time and a given budget. Well, computations, in other words, are practical under a given time and a given budget. Um, so this is like turning the whole world, turning the whole universe um, into a set of computing operations. And it was a great collection of work uh, uh, I can't remember to get his name, Zenal, I think, um, was the editor, which was about this move to understand the universe uh, in terms of computation. Um, oh, no. No, I'm not going to do it. No, I thought I, I, thought I hit that slide. Um, all right. The, the, the Fourier transform. Um, no, it's not going to play either, is it? Okay. Um, Fourier transform, which Kittler talks about so brilliantly. Um, and which is basis of a lot of our communication and, and computing technology. The Fourier transform turns um, something that's continuous, um, so the circle on the left, into something that's discontinuous, so it can be made into zeros and ones. Um, and that move is, again, a really interesting segmentation of time and space. I forget, yeah, yeah, Kittler calls it um, time axis manipulation. Um, which he says is uh, is basic to uh, basic to modern technologies. Um, oh, so after that, and um, yeah, so then we get into the, um, the singularity. Um, uh, so the people on Zoom, so I can't read my slides very well. Um, it's uh, yeah, I mean. <laughs> What I love about this about this figure, um, this is from actually quite a reasonable article. It's it's quite interesting um, that he says basically um, starting at um, you know the omega minus ten to the nine lifetimes, modern humans start colonizing the world. Ten to the eight lifetimes, bow and arrow in the hunting revolution, um, down to um, two to the third, um, omega minus two to the third, um, this is um, called lifetimes, the largest and most dominant empire ever, um, stretched all the way across Asia from Korea to Germany. Um, we then get the edge of the enlightenment, that's nice to see, um, didn't go around all the world and has not really succeeded, but um, 10 to the, that's 10 to the um, two to the minus two lifetimes. And then, it gets faster and faster as we go down. So we're now down to the next level is going to be um, a quarter of a lifetime. Um, and then ever, ever, it'll get ever, ever smaller. Um, so that basically time is speeding up. Now this story of the acceleration of time um, is co-equal, not with the rise of computers. It's co-equal, I would argue, with the rise of information technology and uh, communication technology. Um, so the first examples I know of life speeding up, um, actually Auguste Perdonnet in 1828 
argues that um, you know time and space are being destroyed by the steamship and um, and, and you know and by the railway. Um, so yes, and yeah, what was it? Babbage um, said. <laughs> Typical Babbage, he's a bit of an asshole Babbage. Um, <laughs> but he said that uh, 10 years in modern England was worth a thousand in old cafe. Um, so, you know, which is just amazing when you think about it. I mean, especially since it's old cafe that gave us um, binary arithmetic. <laughs> and that's, that's where Leibniz got it from. Um, and he called it one of the great discoveries um, of humanity. So that's another temporality. Um, there's a third, which actually refers back to a little bit earlier in the talk, um, which is about blockchain. And um, this is from a textbook, Mastering Blockchain. Blockchain will change your life, four exclamation points. Um, I put those in because, you know, when we're talking about singularity, um, you need exclamation points. Um, there is a vision of blockchain singularity where one day we will have a public block blockchain service available that anyone can use, just like Google search engine. It will provide services in all realms of society. This is a public, open, distributed ledger with general purpose rational agents, Machina Economicus, um, running on blockchain, making decisions and interacting with other intelligent autonomous agents on behalf of humans and regulated um, by code instead of law or paper context contracts. Very, ref, very re reminiscent, by the way, of Larry um, Lessig's argument in the, um, um, uh, it's called the something of the horse. Um, sorry? The law of the horse, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it's about the interchangeability between, between code and legal um, in the world. Um, you know, you can either do a code solution or you can do a law solution. Um, or more commonly nowadays, a mix of the two. Um, now, note the ontological complexity that we're talking about here. It's that there are going to be these rational agents making decisions on our behalf far, far faster than we can think. Um, so they're going to be making these, you know, serious decisions um, with a built-in um, built ethical bias of one kind or another. And the ethical bias itself is interesting. It's, um, you know, there's a professor on campus here who works on the, um, uh, the trolley problem, you know, the trolley problem in electric cars where, you know, who are you gonna save? Um, you know, I would love to be able to, you know, actually program the car myself. So, you know, I'd, you know, I'd take out, I don't know, take out women and children first, um, <laughs> leave the old guys standing. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, but, you, but you've got this, you know, this moral work and this political work, um, according to this vision, is going to be done at um, at rates that you you know that you cannot really imagine. So, yeah, I've, I've mentioned um, Michael Lewis's great book Flash Boys. It's a popular book, but it's a great book. Um, and here, because it was the only pretty picture I could get, um, is a French translation of Cronin's Chicago. The uh, Nature's Metropolis. Um, Flash Boys is about the colonization of time, starting also from uh, also from Chicago, as with Cronin, where he traces it through the building of the cable in a straight line from Chicago to New York. For computers and the colonization of space, um, which basically continues the process that Olson's talking about in Nature's Metropolis. And Nature's Metropolis, by the way, has a fantastic uh, temporality attached to it as well, because it describes the, um, the uh, creation of the futures market um, in Chicago. And the futures market is basically, you're not selling a sack of potatoes, which is going, to, um, which is going down to New Orleans. Uh, you're selling the future of a sack of potatoes, a, a future sack of potatoes, which may or may not eventuate um, in real life. Um, and so for computers and the colonization of space, you can see precision agriculture, um, which aims to provide right conditions for every ear of corn in a vast field. So again, you know, instead of dealing with a vast expense, as most farmers would, you're actually dealing with individual plants and what their watering needs are. Again, I, I mean, that, that's sort of hype, but there's a lot of it going on. I mean, you don't really buy John Deere tractors anymore. Um, what you do is you rent the software in them. And that software is incredibly powerful. Um, 
here's one from, uh, I'm always messing the name, um, but for, uh, reminiscent for me of the work of uh, Nicole Storioleski um, about the undersea, the undersea network. Um, and this is uh, a 19th century picture of the undersea cable network. And the temporality in this is interesting because it's a frozen political temporality. It's really, really difficult to negotiate everything you need to negotiate to get, um, you know, clear ship, uh, areas cleared of shipping, um, you know, going through various territorial waters. So here's a 2015 rendered map, um, which shows the internet, um, how the internet um, cables, uh, where the internet cables are. And as you'll see, they're basically the same map. Um, so what we're doing is we're, um, you know, we're freezing in um, various uh, socio-political uh, arrangements which go reach well back into the 19th century. Um, yeah, it reminds me of Paul Edwards has done some good work on this about, you know, every network is built on a previous network. So it's, it's, it's kind of networks all the way down, um, you know, like the canal network, um, basically, well, now the canal network in England is used for high-speed cables. Um, so you've got the, um, you know, at the origins of the Industrial Revolution, you've got the same set of canals which are now being used in a different way. Um, so the theme for this part of the talk uh, is largely this quote that I just love from, um, from Thomas Pynchon um, in Mason and Dixon, which is one of the great books about space and time. If you've not read it. Um, and uh, it's sort of time, you see, says the landlord, um, is the money of science, isn't it? The philosophers need a time common to us all as traders do a common coinage, suggesting as well an interest um, in those events which would occur in several parts of the globe at the same instant. But if I keep going this slowly, I don't have to do optimism, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so let's um, move on to computers, computers and nature. Um, computing and nature, um, and let's see. There's just some examples of how nature has been used as a model um, within computing, you know, many, many of them search algorithms. Uh, so a couple I wanted to call out here, I mean, there's the um, imperialist co competitive model, um, which I love, which is basically taking imperialist politics and putting it into the computer. And there's there's a whole lines of argument you can develop around that. Um, but you've got more generally, you've got shuffled frog leaping, gravitational swarm, rainwater, intelligent rainwater. So all aspects of nature, I mean, it's like, it reminds me of Walford's idea of second nature. All aspects of nature are being imploded uh, into the computer um, that we're creating and then messing the time with. And I should call out John Seberg here, um, who wrote a brilliant thesis about uh, the Internet of Things. And he made me aware of this article um, by Neil Gross, uh, which was a, where the term was first used, the Internet of Things. Gross is interesting, who's a pragmatic philosopher. Um, actually, I'm, I should do something about that at some stage, because there's also um, Peter Thiel, who's the evil guy um, in charge of uh, Rand Palantir, um, he actually did his thesis in Germany um, on talk of Parsons. Um, and it's really interesting to see the connection between the, you know, the politics and the person. So the earth will go on electronic skin. I mean, here's the picture. Hundreds of thousands of computers, PCs working in concert have already tackled complex computing problems. In the future, some scientists expect spontaneous computer networks to emerge, forming a single huge digital creature. And I was reminded about this when I read uh, Merlin Sheldrake's wonderful book about um, fantastic fungi. I truly recommend this book. Um, but uh, he, uh, Adam Adamski from the Center for Unconventional Computing, I think in Lancaster in the UK, um, fantasized about creating a vast underground network, um, underground computing, computer monitoring the environment. And fungi, he argued, possess all the senses used by humans, lights, chemical, gases, gravity, and electrical fields. Um, so while we tend to associate fungi with their um, visible extrusions, mushrooms, what we miss is the work being done by the mycelial networks whose operations were dubbed by 
um, a nature journalist just before the millennium, um, a, a wood wide web. So it's mm. a very cute title. Um, those who want to know more about the Wood Wide Web stuff, I mean, I really recommend uh, Rick Powers's um, novel on the um, the over the over story for that. Um, so I started thinking, you know, when I saw this, you know, this kind of merging between the computer, the Internet of Things, and turning nature itself into a computer through its networks, um, and you know, the you know the, the two sort of meet in the middle. Um, so I think I have something else to say now. Yeah, and turning the earth into a giant self-regulating uh, computer uh, would be the vision. Um, so again, computers in nature, um, what's his name? Andrea Santinopoulos, um, you know, has a picture of leaf cutter ants on the, uh, on, the front of his, um, on the front of his book on mastering Bitcoin. Um, why the bugs on the cover? The leaf cutter ants is a species that exhibits highly complex behavior in a colony superorganism, but each individual ant operates on a set of simple rules driven by social interaction and the exchange of pheromones. <laughs> next to humans, leafcutter ants, I thought this kind of a silly statement. Uh, next to humans, leaf, leafcutter ants form the largest and most complex animal societies on earth. Although ants form a case-based society and have a queen producing offspring, there is no central authority or leader in an ant colony. The highly intelligent and sophisticated behavior exhibited by a multi-million member colony is an emergent property uh, from the interactions of the individuals in the social network. Nature demonstrates that decentralized systems can be resilient and that and can produce um, complexity and incredible sophistication. Now, there's an interesting historical argument here, by the way, that um, the claim is being made that we're taking the inspiration from the leafcutter ant colonies. And you can argue just as well the other way around that the reason that we're looking at leafcutter ant colonies is because of the ways that computers have developed in a decentralized, uh, theoretically decentralized fashion um, over about the last uh, over the last 50 years. Um, and I sort of like the fact that um, oh my gosh, I didn't need to spit up. I sort of like the fact that um, he mentions the case system and the queen and the lack of central authority of leader. I mean, this is exactly the model, uh, this way Linux runs. It's exactly the way GitHub runs. You know, there are a group in the center who cling on to all the power and can make basic changes to the code. And there's all the other drones around um, who can make use of the system or, or suggest changes. Um, right, yeah. Um, so uh, this really should be elsewhere. Um, yeah, um, Gabriel Alcaraz just wrote the brilliant, um, a, a brilliant book about, um, uh, sorry, brilliant thesis about GitHub as a perfect archive, um, as in theory as uh, blockchain, uh, with the Genesis block um, as the first block, and you, you create um, an eternal, an immutable, eternal ledger. Um, and I won't go into more details about Bitcoin mining, um, but the, the, the reason I brought that, that point in, in this part of the talk um, is because um, that's very much modeled on the ways, the memory practices that we've developed over the last, you know, over the last actually several millennia um, for trying to create perfect memory. Um, and it's a wonderful project that Helga here in the audience was part, uh, was associated with, which is PIKUL, P-I-Q-U-L, um, which is out at Svalbard in Norway, uh, where the, um, the PIKUL folks want to get a permanent, um, a permanent cultural record of, I think it's Norway, but also it's UNESCO sites around the world or something. And the way they do it is they, um, they inscribe onto very, very long lasting films, um, how to build the computer, that will run them, um, how to program the computer that will run them, um, and then how to, you know, how to visualize what's there. Uh, so you've got this, you know, huge effort um, around that. Um, all right, I don't know how many of you know, know the concept of Boltzmann brains. Um, Boltzmann brains are actually pretty interesting. I mean, it's the, it's the, the, there's an argument about why 
Um, well, are humans privileged observers in the universe? And um, according to Boltzmann, who's one of the early and greatest theoreticians of entropy, um, the intelligence should spontaneously manifest um, at various points. And when it spontaneously manifests, it will do so in vaster, far vaster numbers than all of humanity. So the privileged observer becomes the, um, becomes the Boltzmann brain. But then, you know, a very good roboticist, Hans Morovich, um, writes that um, he anticipates a far future in which a portion of the universe is rapidly transformed into a cyberspace, when, where it's being, wherein beings establish, extend, and defend identities as patterns of information flow, um, becoming finally a bubble of mind, <laughs> a bubble of mind um, expanding at near life speed. Um, and finally, um, this is getting right, right down into the theory of the natural world. Um, it's a, no, it wasn't from Lewis, but it's a Lewis kind of point. Um, there was an argument at one stage that um, the, um, th they'd found faster than light travel, um, which is untrue. So the stock market immediately got onto it because <laughs> um, it meant that if it works, we can make a, you know, we can, we, you know, we can reverse the order of buying and selling. Um, so I just love that. Um, it's, uh, oh, that from stuff on it. oh, optimism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so computing and control, um, this, the homeostasis, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, we, you know, we talk about ourselves as a society which is based around, um, which is based around, um, you know, progress and eternal progress. Although actually, if you look on, on what is it, uh, Google Ngram, uh, the word progress is more or less disappearing from the language now. I mean, it, it peaked in the 60s, you know, the red hot um, progress of technological civilization, but now it's, you know, now it's not. But homeostasis was, you know, an era of Victorian certainty, um, with, which is again, an, uh, you know, a period that we associate with a vast, vast speed um, is first of all comes from the uh, the governor um, that's on the top left. I won't go into technical details, but it's basically a way of achieving homeostasis um, within an uh, an engine that's running so that it doesn't get too hot um, or too cold. Um, it then goes um, right into Daisy World. Um, oh, and Claude Bernard, sorry, in in um, in medicine. Um, inspired by the by the governor, um, then goes into one of the foundational texts of the 20th century about the environment. Um, there's a program, Daisy Wool, um, by um, oh, that's a program, that's a program da Daisy Wool. Um, the um, Daisy Wool, for those that don't know it, is you know it's it was basically a very very simple argument that created the idea largely led to the idea of Gaia, which is so popular nowadays. Um, daisy world is, if the world gets too hot, then more white daisies are created, so we have a higher albedo, so energy is reflected off into space. Then if um, the Earth starts cooling down too much, um, we get more black daisies, uh, so they absorb heat and the Earth warms up. So it's a, it, it's a Mickey Mouse version of achieving um, achieving. Uh, homeostasis, uh, global homeostasis. Um, the other examples I, I just liked, um, I got my total, totally good justification for them. Um, so this is a statement that, I, I mean, as soon as I read that by Lynn Margulis, Lynn Margulis was one of the two people um, who embedded the concept of Gaia. And Lynn Margulis was thoroughly brilliant, thoroughly brilliant. and. Um, she argues that machines are one of DNA's latest strategies for autopoiesis. And I think that's one of the first kinds of conclusions that I want to make, and I think an optimistic conclusion, is that um, if we see we, we make a mistake, if we see ourselves as separate from nature, uh, we make a mistake if we see our genetic heritage as defining who we are as humans, 90% of the cells in our bodies aren't human, um, we make a mistake as well if we say there are machines over there and humans over here. What we should recognize is that we're building a world together with the machines 
and DNA is doing very well, thank you, um, through this process of um, autopoiesis um, that is helping us, it's helping us build. Now, yeah, first of all, I, I, this is one of my great um, classification quotes of uh, recent times. Bumblebees can be classified as fish in California. Um, in a move that could allow a broad range of insects to be considered for endangered species status, the state Supreme Court has found that California bum bumblebees can be created under the law, um, can be protected under the law as a type of fish. Um, and I just love it. I mean, I just love that. I mean, it, it, you know, it reminds us of the, the work that classification systems do. Classifications don't have to be right. They're generally very approximate, but they do a lot of work in the world. Um, and that led me to thinking about, um, I will get to autism, but this is a kind of slightly slower, <laughs> slower route, this one. Uh, I was reading a few weeks ago, um, uh, Lee Smolin's Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, uh, where he describes a, a lattice theory of space, which is a really interesting description of you know, space. So space is, it's not particularly, it's, it's lines between events. And this actually, um, he draws back to the um, to Leibniz-Clark um, debate, which is one of the great debates in the history of science. Um, Clark was representing Newton, and uh, Newton was being accused um, by Leibniz of blasphemy uh, because he was assuming that there was a vast space-time into which God fit, however effulgently. Um, and so, you know, um, Leibniz's point of view was it's basically all about events and networks, networks of events. Um, now it's interesting, you know, um, oh no, sorry, it shouldn't have happened. Um, it's interesting how to think this, because when I read that argument about quantum space, it, it's exactly the same argument as Latour makes in Action Network Theory. I mean, there's, 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 there's no real distinction, it's just a, a different set of words that are being used. Um, and I thought, well, Actually, both Leibniz, sorry, both um, Smolin and Latour um, go back to Leibniz. Um, but intellectual history is really not what the story is about for me. Um, it's more about the development of the commodity form. And Leibniz was thinking abstractly about the development of the commodity form and produces his network theory which then starts to, you know, as you know, Castells and the rise of the network society, networks started taking everything over. Um, now, the, the positive aspect of this is that, you know, we often feel that we're trapped in the, in, in the iron cage of classifications. In a sense, we are if we keep reproducing the old classifications and reifying them. Um, so the positive end of the story is, let's just, you know, start living more interesting lives, start living life differently. The philosophy will follow once we start new ways of living. Um, now, thanks to Simon Penny for, um, for this poem, uh, which, which I will read. This is uh, you know, Richard Brodigan, 67. Um, and I'm sort of interested in people's reactions to this because there's one argument that it's, well, Simon thinks it's totally ironic. I think it's very, very warm and it's a beautiful vision of the future. Um, I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where animals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think, right now please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labours that well, seems to have gone, gone out the window, that, that dream. Um, and join back to nature, return to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. And I actually do see that as a very positive kind of message. I mean, it's, it's a kind of future we can create, um, but uh, certainly not doing it the right way at the moment. So a couple of very brief bits of conclusion. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can justify this slide. Uh, that's what my notes say, is I don't know if I can justify this slide. Um, it's um, Wings of Desire. Um, and it's on the left. There's, um, there's a beautiful uh, poem about childhood, um, which, is, um, which is declaimed during Wings of Desire. 
um, a kind of very unmediated and beautiful childhood. Um, but the angels who watch over all of Earth, what do the angels like to hang out? They hang out in the Berlin Public Library. I mean, you know, they find solace through the books, through the reading. Um, and I do find something beautiful about that. So let's finish with Spaceship Earth. Um, if you're watching attentively, and there will be a test afterwards, if you're watching attentively, um, when Lee and I were wearing our shirts as we got hand fasted, um, there was a picture of Spaceship Earth. Um, the canonical Spaceship Earth figure, um, there's an irony to it, because um, the only reason we got a picture of Spaceship Earth was by using internal combustion engines <laughs> to, 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 to go into the sky to take a picture of this beautiful blue planet, this beautiful green planet. Um, but the whole Earth catalogue, um, as um, Stuart Brands was, was one of the, well, ask, um, ask Fred Turner, he'll know much better than me. Um, the whole Earth catalogue was, um, really basic in pushing um, Lovelock and uh, Margulis's idea of Gaia and very much used the concept of Spaceship Earth in order to do it. And um, I think that's, that's sort of where I come down. And that's, I'm turning into Teilhard de Chardin in my old age. Because uh, Teilhard de Chardin basically argued that, um, you know, we are building up as a globe um, until eventually we're going to create a Noah sphere. And for me, there's something comforting and interesting about that vision. And I think a lot of the reasons why we seem to be so negative about computers and computing and, and critical discourse is because we don't recognize the real beauty and change, which is absolutely possible at the moment. So thank you. We do have some time for questions. I'd ask you to, if you ask a question, to sort of uh, try to project so that the microphones will pick things up. Yeah, well, it's also for my benefit because my hearing is pretty bad. So, um, and then Jeff, I'll let you call questions and then I'll, I'll just sort of like loom when, it, when, it's, when it's getting on time for a bit. Well, it's pretty much time now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, but you're not, you're not done yet. <laughs> All right, any questions or comments? Yeah. I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask it anyway. I like your optimistic or hopeful message that you articulated there at the end. And I wonder if you have anything that you want to, or could say about why you think we have reached this critical and pessimistic uh, kind of period, in, in particular in thinking about socio-technical systems. Yeah. Um, I wonder if in some part it's due to what you and others wrote about in the late 80s and early 90s as the great divide mm -hmm. between the scholars who study and the scientists who build. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Yeah. Yeah, that was Matt, Matt Ratto um, from the audience asking me about um, the, um, asking me about how we got to such a pessimistic place. Um, I think it's a um, you know it's it's a good way of good way of describing it, um, and ending up with a nice reference to a book that I co-wrote. Um, it's interesting, and it's um, Helen Nissenbaum and several of you in the several others of you in the audience were associated with a series of workshops that we did on uh, values in the design of information systems and technology, and. Um, there was a project that sort of grew out of that, which was about the um, the future internet, uh, where NSF funded, I think, six projects to, to, to build the internet of the future. And the um, computer scientists who we dealt with, we, we couldn't talk with them, and it's over a four or five year period, but we just couldn't talk with them properly. We didn't find the language. But what was really interesting was that, you know, they had a fairly consistent line, and the consistent line was, Ethics and politics don't happen at the level of computer architecture. They're at a kind of higher level um, of the computer stack. Um, so they, they occur basically at the software level, not at the architecture level. Um, so in one sense, I believe the pessimism is, you know, is completely justified in the sense that if we're building these things without a proper critical analysis um, of what's happening um, on the part of computer scientists, 
Um, and, you know, for me, this is the reason, you know, why we need to be rethinking the university right now. Um, you know, it's the folks in the humanities don't understand the computing well enough and tend to be fairly hostile to it. And folks in the computing industry tend to be far too techy and not at all interested in, you know, the philosophical vagaries. Uh, so I think, you know, it's sort of a rose out of a totally artificial, um, totally artificial division of uh, the academy. Um, which happened, what, 1780s, 1820s, when the, when the disciplines were being founded. Um, that's one answer. I should give you a better one, but I, but I won't. <laughs> cool. Oh, sorry. And then, yeah. Very minor, really, but when you, when you were talking about time and computation, one of the things I thought you were going to say is talk about is the one of the things I thought you were going to talk about is how computers have also synchronized human time around the entire planet with devices like this. You know, we can't be late anymore. There's no blurring that we used to experience with the oh my watch is moving slow. Yeah. All right. Um yeah the question there from Paul Edwards in the audience was about um the importance of synchronizing and synchronicity. Um, so we had the world expert in this field in Helga. Um, so please talk with him afterwards about it. Um, I mean, you remember that failed attempt there was to build swatch time years okay. ago? So, so you could buy these watches that were always showing the same time at any part of the world you're in. Um, and that, that was a really weird failure. But you're totally right about the, syn the synchronization and syncing. Uh, this is a... Um, it's beautifully discussed actually in a book that um, Strogatz um, wrote called uh, Sync. Um, and Sync is about the process of synchrony and synchronization, um, both in nature and across human fields. Um, so, mayflies, uh, no, is it mayflies? Uh, fireflies, um, after a while, they will go into sync. And um, there's a lovely example that I use quite a lot of. Um, if you get a set of pendulums um, working together in the same room and they're, they're actually on, you know, they're at loggerheads with each other, within a while they're going to be in sync. Um, you know, much, much the same way that uh, women sharing a house will tend to, their periods will tend to move into sync um, after a while. Um, and um, yeah, and I think, yes, synchronization is absolutely central. I mean, the first map. The first synchronic clock I ever saw um, was 1796, and it was about the um, um, what's it, all the events in on Earth on a particular day in December, um, and so you know just showed this on a you know on a huge face face dial. Um, so the interest in synchronicity and synchronizing, um, well, I would guess. Keep, keep, going, keep going back to the stock market, but I'd say there's there's some kind of connection there. Um, that um, there's sort of a paradox to our temporality at the moment. Um, human movement is getting more and more slow. Um, you know, migrants, you know, waiting for years to know whether they've got asylum or not. But on the other hand, computer, um, um, computer mediated trading is going faster and faster in a kind of abstract space and time, which is Galilean abstract space and time, which Sean Rattel puts at the origin of the, um, um, the origin of um, the commodity form uh, in a brilliant article called Science as Alienated Consciousness. Um, yeah, so sinking, sinking our behaviors. Oh yeah, sorry, just one more example, um, then I'll try and say something. Um, Napoleon had that vision of education um, you know in the um, you know in the early uh, early 19th century where he he wanted it to be that every school boy and girl would be on the same page of the same book um, all over the all over the French Empire and that was that was the goal of creating a kind of uniform um, you know kind of uniform uh, French culture which is largely the way in which French citizenship is still defined today, um, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, so thinking. Um, I 
I mean, I didn't talk about in computing the NPT, NTP protocol. Um, computers only work internationally and over a long time if they can sync together really well. And you've got various, and they've got to have a great clock. Um, so we're not escaping the clock by having ever faster times. What we're getting is ever more fine grained synchronization, uh, which is occurring in the early days of the internet, network time, you know, could you know, be down to about half a second or something like that. I mean, now it's the milliseconds. Um, the company that controls time on this planet is Google um, because Google got pissed off um, with the, the idea of the leap second because um, the leap second sort of messed up its systems. Um, so um, what they developed um, was an algorithm so they could smear the leap second over the whole year. And that's so that Google smear is absolutely central to our current synchronization practices. We can take there's one more question between Jeff and a glass of wine. Dangerous <laughs> <laughs> place to be, as usual. Here I am. I'm sorry, two more questions. She was waiting. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, and this is partly in absolutely in a, to do with my hearing, so I only got about half the question, which is um, the upper range tends to go first as you're losing your hearing, and I really, really need to to get some hearing aids soon. Um, but yeah, I mean the the concept of how to create a unified optimism, I think you're asking, um, is I think that's a really, really interesting one, and I'm not I'm not certain I've got a I'm not certain I've got a good answer. I will give you an answer which I forgot to um, which I a point I forgot to make during the talk um, is that we much of our political activity. Um, is based on a system which doesn't work as it's meant to be working. I mean, democracy has been broken for a long time, um, but it takes our attention away from where the political work is being done. Um, so I think that's it precisely why we need people who are politically motivated, um, who get in at the level of, um, of computing infrastructure, who get in at the level of how classification systems form and are developed. Um, and I think that's that's basically what we need to do is change the site of where we're building our politics. So John, quick one. Yeah, very quick. And it actually, it has to do with optimism and pessimism as well. Um, these are, this is a fairly canonical armature, right? You're either optimistic or pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And it's lovely to see a sort of radical move towards optimism because we can and are so pessimistic of late, but there's an unmarked category here, which is, sort of a grateful indifference, right? A Zen-like um, existence alongside wherein the pessimistic or the optimistic is not foreground, but just is. And I wonder if, if there is room in computing for this type of Zen existence, for this type of going with the river, being a part of it. Huh. That's a really interesting point. This is John Seberger in the audience asking um, about pessimism and optimism. Um, and, um, whether there's um, the excluded middle, um, Aristotelian terms. I mean, whether there is um, a set of Zen indifference, um, which you could which you could develop, which is actually a really really interesting question, because um, it's where I am spiritually largely is in terms of Zen yeah. indifference. I mean, it's the only thing that keeps me out, gets me out of bed in the morning is <laughs> Zen indifference. If I read the newspaper, I just kind of bury myself under the covers. Um, but um, yeah. I, 
Zen indifference can be can be problematic. I mean, as a student here, I think one of your students was doing work um, on um, uh, mindfulness mm. and mindfulness training um, within um, you know within Silicon Valley, which really took off several years ago. Uh, especially many executives. See, the executives could be, you know, do mindfulness. The drones didn't get it. But um, <laughs> the mindfulness itself, you know, can be described as a as an ideology of indifference. Mm. And the danger with indifference is always that, you know, you risk tipping from one to the other. You risk becoming sort of deliberately apolitical. You know, it's like I don't care what's happening, and that would be the spectre I'd be worried about. So this is the looming that I threatened was going to happen. Um, I know that there are other questions that people will have, but I suggest that we move them outside as indeed we move ourselves outside. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And can I also, just before we go, I just want to thank the Zoom attendees who very kindly stuck with it during the whole show. So thank you. Thank you. I always want to know.